I would say right after World War II. And he was like a good thousand some feet away from the, the cliff. And the last time I, now maybe it's been about eight years since I went to uh, Woodby Island. Well, the house is all gone. That's how far the erosion has went. And the water has come right up another thousand feet towards Langley. And that's because the ground, you know, is, is, is just like dropping in the ocean. But I just think a lot of earth changes are going on. We, we're slightly in a tilt of our planet and the magnetic field's kind of drifting uh, big time now, not little time. So I'm, we got a lot of things all going on at once right now. Well, I mean, talking about Florida, I, I mean, you've seen pictures of places like the seashells, you know, in the Indian Ocean and the Maldives, where, I mean, the highest point of, of, of those islands, I think, above sea level is something like 20 feet, you know. And when the, uh, when the high tide happens, the, uh, the ocean literally washes over the entire island, right? And I've seen some pictures recently where the same thing was happening in parts of Florida, that, you know, the, the ocean comes up and washes right over the roads because, of course, what happens is as the, as the ocean warms up, and it doesn't have to warm up a lot, right? I mean, because there's a lot of water out there. So, you know, you get a half a degree temperature or something increase in the, in the uh, temperature of the water, and the water expands, Right. So there's more ocean now. There's more water. And so it, it, it gets deeper. It rises, right? Never mind all the ice uh, melting on the North Pole and everything. Um, the actual ocean is getting deeper just because the temperature of it is going up. So, yeah, you're right. And I have, I have grandkids, too. And um, <clears throat> I was listening to somebody on a TV show today, and they were saying, you know, that they're worried about the kind of um, the kind of society that they're leaving to their grandkids, and I have to say, you know, as as, as you just pointed out a minute ago, um, I've thought about the same thing. You know, I mean, it used to be like I grew up in the early fifties. I was born in forty seven, so I'm in my early seventies now. But it, I remember when, uh, when when I was in school, you know, in the early fifties and in the sixties. I mean, it seemed like life was just getting better and better and better and better every year, you know, and people were predicting, you know, all these amazing discoveries and computers and flying cars and flying to the moon, you know. And, of course, a lot of that stuff has, has, has come true. But in a lot of ways, the economy hasn't followed suit, you know. Um, I, was, I was listening to someone the other day that was saying that in real terms, when you take inflation into account, the average person's wages haven't increased since about 1985. So in a lot of ways, you know, even though science and technology seems to be making these great leaps and bounds, as a society, you know, what we're, what we're creating for, our, for ourselves and for our kids and our grandkids, we might have peaked already. I mean, we might have had the best of what we can expect already. And that's, you know, that's a that's a sad situation to contemplate. Well, you know, young people, you know, uh, since you were a professor and all that stuff, you, and we talked about, you know, the young people and their education and, and not learning and stuff. You know, it's really funny. I was talking because I have eight kids. I was talking to one of them one day here in the past week. And they, you know, they're talking about, well, gee, they're making like $13 an hour. They can't make ends meet. And, and I, you know, and they said, well, gee, you know, you know, I don't know what's going on. And I try to explain to them, you know, when I was born it was 1952, my parents bought their first real house in Seattle in 1952, and they paid $5,000 for that house. And I remember right. when I was a little kid, my dad made like $80, $90 a week. And that, you know, that fed the whole family. I remember candy bars for three cents. You know, I, I remember you could go buy a, a bottle of pop for like 10 cents. I mean, life was not any different than it is now. Cars were really, when you think about it, cars. But then when I got into like junior high school, you know, I was walking by a new house they built, a split level house. And they wanted fifteen thousand dollars for it in seattle and I'm, i said to myself oh wow fifteen thousand is a lot of money 
And, you know, I, I don't think the wages, like you just mentioned, the wages haven't kept up with inflation. It, it, it's really a, a twofold thing. People don't understand. I mean, people live probably actually just as well off, you know, in the 60s financially as they are nowadays. Yeah, it doesn't seem to make much difference. You know, I agree. Um, but, think, you know, I mean, you know, real estate always seems like it's uh, it's priced out of control. But but it's amazing how things how things change. Like uh, I had a friend in Vancouver. He retired some years ago and his house. He put it up for sale and he got five hundred thousand dollars for it, which amazed me, you know, um, at the time because it wasn't a very big house. Anyway, he was um, he was telling me that he got he bought this house in 1946 after the war, you know. Uh, he bought it on not the GI Bill, that's an American thing, but, you know, a similar program in Canada where if you were a veteran, the government would help you get a down payment for a house together, you know. And he bought this house, he said it cost $1,500. And except for the fact that the government helped him out, he wouldn't have been able to afford this thing because back then the wages were so low that it was a lot of money, $1,500. Well, when he, when he finally sold it, you know, 40 years later or so, it was worth a half a million. And you remember when, when you were growing up and when I was growing up, you know, we talked about millionaires. You know, when I grow up, I want to be a millionaire, right? To be a millionaire seemed like it was, you know, like flying to the moon. It seemed like it was the next thing to being impossible, right? Well, now it takes a million dollars to buy a house. What? Everybody is a millionaire, you know, in almost right in some way. Well, um, I noticed. I noticed the other day in the paper that um, Apple became the first trillion dollar company, right? And I thought, wow, a trillion dollar valuation for a company. The, how, how rare is that? Well, about three days later, they said, oh, Amazon is now worth a trillion dollars, you know, a trillion dollars. I mean, you can't even imagine how much that is, you know. I mean, the numbers are just impossible to um, to visualize and imagine, you know. Well, the bad problem is, let's say you went out and bought a house for $3,000 back when, right? So you had this house, and yeah, naturally you put improvements on, you did whatever, but then you know what, 30 years later, 40 years later, you sell the house and you go, oh, gee, I made $400,000 on this house, right? Now, you go out and you want to buy a, a house again, right, in a different area. Guess what? <laughs> You're paying almost what you, the whole profit you made, you know, you, 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 you're going to pay it to buy another house. Exactly. So you, exactly. Didn't, really, you yeah. didn't really accomplish anything. No, it's all a big illusion, right? I mean, um, you know, we, we hear about these people, you know, 100, 200, 300 years ago, you know, the rich people or the royalty, you know, getting a, getting a stipend from the, from the government, you know, like a thousand pounds a year or something, right? And that allowed them to live like, like uh, kings and queens practically, right? A thousand pounds a year, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Um, it seems like nothing now. I mean, you know, we got to make that in a week to almost to survive, right? It's crazy. Well, you know, I sit back and just for the time I make my mortgage payment, I, I make my wife's car payment, I pay one of my motorcycle payments, I pay my utility bills, I pay all my little, you know, charge cards, and I pay everything else. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm dumping out close to $5,000 a month just to survive. No kidding. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that can't make ends meet, you know, that are working. They call, you know, they have a new term for it, right? It's called the gig economy, right? Where people can't get a full-time job. So they're doing gigs, you know, they're delivering uh, pizza two nights a week, or they're working in a restaurant a couple nights a week, or they have a, they have a job where they're working in a hotel in the evening, you know, doing, doing maintenance work or something. Um, the, you know, when, when, when I grew up and when you grew up in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s even, you know, it seemed like a lot of people, most of the people that I knew, were in unions. They had good jobs, good pensions, good benefits, you know. Uh, not many people are getting that these days. No, and, you know, everything is done offshore. You know, I didn't even realize. I thought Curtis Mathis 
back 30 years ago was the last company making TVs in the United States. But then I was reading like maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, there was a company back on the East Coast or, you know, one of the southern states that still actually was making TVs. I didn't even know TVs made in the United States. It shocked me. But they said they were going to have to lay off the hundred and some employees they have because of the tariffs that our president put on that now they can't, um, well, they can't make any money. Uh, they can't get the parts cheap enough to build them and uh, they have no market. So, I mean, I, I, I just, I get so, what can I say? It's nothing anybody can do. It, you just have to go with the role and then hope it doesn't go, you know, snake eyes. Well, I wonder, you know, sometimes, um, if if life is really changing all that much, you know, I mean, when you look at the big picture, I mean, uh, you know, when we read history, like people in the Middle Ages, you know, well, of course, there they thought the world was flat, you know, and they didn't know anything that happened outside their their uh, particular village, perhaps certainly outside their uh, country. You know, they didn't know anything that happened. And um, sometimes an invading army would come through and 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 threaten them all with death, you know, or a disease would come through and wipe half them out. So they kind of lived in this situation where life could change at the drop of a hat. There was no certainty about anything. And I always thought, you know, life is so much better now because we know so much more. There's so much more scientific information that we know. But in some ways, life is still the same, you know, like, do we really know what's going on with the economy or with global warming, you know, global warming or something like that? I mean, it, it almost seems in some ways that we're living the same kind of life, you know, that that the things that really affect us, by and large, we can't control. No, that's the whole problem. We ha- I hate to say it, I'm not going to get political, but I mean... It, uh, how, it, it just hasn't got any better, and it's not going to get any better, you know. And the, when they talk about, like, fake news, you know, like the news media is giving fake information, well, probably the fake information they're getting is uh, giving out is probably what they're getting from the government. Yeah, this is really amazing, you know. I remember uh, not too long ago when the Internet started up, right? I mean, when's that, 15 years ago or something? You know, it seemed like it was just so amazing because all this information now is available just at the click of a mouse, you know. And I couldn't, it, I couldn't imagine any downside to having too much information. Well, what we've seen this year, of course, is that there is a downside to it because there's so much information out there now, and especially, you know, someone like you being in the media you realize that there are so many media channels now. You know, there's MSNBC and there's Fox News and there's, you know, the New York Times and, you know, what some people are calling fake news. And, of course, there has to be fake news out there, but which is fake? I mean, is it the stuff that I'm reading? Is is that the fake stuff? Or is it the stuff that somebody else is reading, you know? It's really hard to tell. And the whole thing with um, with Facebook and all these media channels, you know, is that something that I certainly didn't foresee and a lot of people didn't foresee is the fact that now people can basically read whatever information they want to read, you know, and they can have a completely different mindset and a, and a completely different philosophy than I've got, and yet the their point of view gets supported because they're watching different channels than I am. They're, you know, they're reading different online e-zines than I am, right? So it's like, is there more information or is there really less information? It's, it's really hard to tell. Well, I think they go out and they purposely give information to counterdict it, to basically to basically hide what's going on i mean they to debunk it so i think there's a lot of people that are debunking it in fact one of my guests who's been on the show about four times is a former uh well he was a contractor with the dod for like 13 years and the stuff he was telling me that goes on really really scares me because i mean everything you look at on your computer everything you 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 say on your phone everything you say around a smart tv in your uh, house 
I mean, it's being recorded, and then, you know, they can...